Some familiar faces and some new names there as well, I noticed. Welcome everybody um, to Australia at Home. I think it's the sixth Thursday of the lockdown and um, yes, it's becoming a way of life, isn't it? Um, before we get started, my name's Peter Lewis. I'm the director of Essential Media, one of the partners behind Australia at Home, along with Guardian Australia, the Centre for Australian Progress and Principal Co. I'll start off, as we always do, by recognising that wherever we are around Australia, we're on Indigenous land. I'm on the land of the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation. And as all of you, I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, today, we've got a great discussion, um, I hope, I, I expect, um, around the bloody app um, and the app that's at the centre of a whole bunch of public health, privacy, public policy discussions. Um, one of the bits of feedback we've been getting from our community is we tend to agree on everything in this space and it becomes all a little bit cosy. I suspect today we'll be having some different views and I reckon that's a great thing too. For those that are new to Australia at home, um, this Zoom platform is an amazing collaborative tool. We encourage people to, at the top right hand corner of their screen, hit it to gallery view. There's over, there's well over 100 people in the room and you get a sense of being in a room full of a whole bunch of people who are connected. That's the idea behind Australia at home. We're trying to create a space where people can come together, share ideas every day at lunchtime and try to stop each other by, from going slowly mad. Um, use the chat function on the right. Firstly, if you feel like introducing yourself to everybody else that's in the room, and if you come from an organisation or come from a certain part of Australia, let people know where you're from. Um, Hannah, who's on tech support, um, We'll be keeping an eye. If any of you got problems with audio or anything, feel free to send her a direct message. Um, and also, as the chat emerges, put down the questions you'd like to ask because we'll be calling you into the chat as we go. Um, I think that's all. Finally, we record this and post it on YouTube later. So please keep things nice, particularly if you've got the stage um, and particularly on a day like this where there will be probably a few different views. Um, and it, ha you know, I, I, I've found this a really challenging issue to think through. Um, the app has created a moment where we're asked, where we're actually being asked to make a decision about technology. I think usually technology is imposed on us, but this time we need to say it's okay. And more fundamentally, the government needs us to say it's okay for them to meet their um, public health objectives. So I think this creates a bit of a historic moment in the way that we approach technological change. Um, I've been big on the idea that people need to have agency over the way technology develops. Um, I wrote a book earlier this year about, or last year, um, Webtopia, which was looking at these issues and saying that we need to take control of technology and imagining a future where we could. And I think this, this future is now upon us and the, the decisions we make will say a lot about who we are as both individuals and as a society. And they're kind of the questions we're gonna um, have a look at today. We've got a great panel. We've got Claire O'Neill, who's Labor, Federal Labor's technology lead. So she's the person that will play a role in framing the opposition's um, position when this technology is taken to parliament in a couple of weeks time. We've got um, Sasha Molitoris, who is an ethicist, former journalist and film reviewer, who's taken all those skills together for this fantastic book, Net Privacy, that he is launching in another Zoom tonight. And at the end of it, we'll um, send you an invite to that as well. Um, and our third member is Lucy Kralisova, who is the, the Australian representative of Access Now, which is a global digital rights act advocacy group. So between the three of them and all of you, I reckon we're going to be able to come at this issue from a whole bunch of different angles. But the other thing I want to do today, because I think there will be conflicted views, and we're going to go out on the high wire here of Zoom technology, we can ask a poll, and we're just really interested as we, before we do our intros and get started, um, if everybody would like, the poll will pop up on your screen as long as you're not on an iPhone. And if you like, I'd, lo I'd love to know, A, whether you have already downloaded the app, whether you're intending to download the app, whether you're a hell no way person, or whether you're still to make up your mind, just to sort of get a sense of, you know, where everyone's standing. So that'll come up as we, as, as we speak. Um, I, um, 
if it doesn't work. Yeah, there we go. So we can all sort of fill that out. Um, wow, it's sort of like a bit of a split, isn't it? So while people are filling that out, let's start by welcoming our guests in and we'll, we'll go round the three and then I'll give you the poll back at the end. But we'll start off with Claire. Like the question we ask all our guests at Australia at Home, firstly, how are you going through this? And then secondly, what, what's been the thought process behind your decision whether or not to download the app? Yeah, okay, well, thanks, Peter. And thanks so much, everyone, for having me. It's lovely to be with you and looking forward to the conversation. Um, how am I going? Oh, gosh, this is like a group counselling session <laughs> with uh, 150 counsellors. Um, I'm really grateful to be in Australia right now where I think, you know, we're, we're all lucky because we're not living in a country where tens of thousands of people are dying from a pandemic. Um, obviously, my life's been completely turned on its head um, like the rest of everyone on this call. I've got two really young kids, so we're grappling with how to absorb eight hours a day of extra childcare. But in the context of every wrong thing that's happening in the world, that's probably not too bad a problem to have. Um, I think on the on the app, yes, I have downloaded the app and I did that as soon as I could. The reason that I did that is informed by, I think, my, my main experience of this crisis, as for all of us. Um, for me, that's been um, literally hundreds and hundreds of conversations that I've had with my constituents about the absolutely devastating economic impact that this crisis is having on their lives. I mean, we started out with a real health emergency here and it's quickly morphed into probably what will be the biggest downturn we've had in Australia since probably the depression and the cost on the people that I represent is just profound. Um, and talking to people every day who are literally, you know, working away in a normal um, sense one day and then three days later, literally not knowing how they're going to pay their mortgage and put food on the table is a very shocking thing. Um, so we need the app because this period of um, this crisis where we're going to be trying to open up the economy while we're in the midst of a global pandemic raging around us may actually last for quite a long time. And anything I can do to minimise the impact on the people who I represent, I'm going to do. And part of that is making the app work. If I can just say, even though I'm desperate for this app to work, I've got a lot of reservations about the way that it's been handled. Um, you know, we need everything to go right for the share of the population to download the app. We need to download it to make it useful and valuable. Anywhere from somewhere between 75% of the population, maybe down to 40% of the population. But we've never seen Australia do something like that before. So I think there's been a lot of um, kind of missteps along the way that I'm a bit disappointed by um, that perhaps if they hadn't happened, we would have been more successful. But my main focus is on doing everything I can through the policy process to make sure that we get as many people downloading the app as we can, because that's the way to get the people I represent back to work. Thanks, Claire. I might throw to you, Lucy. Um, how are you going? And what's been your thought process behind the app? Hey, thank you. Um, I love the tone of these conversations and everyone like checks in. <laughs> so for me, I think like everyone, I cycle through um, periods of like desperation and helplessness and then kind of joy because I think the connectivity um, has really brought out um, sort of the best in us and you know everyone struggles in the same way right now and I think that's bridging a lot of gaps in a way. Um, I do have family, uh, my mother is in, posted in China for work and um, I have a lot of family in Belgium and US um, from Europe so kind of the hardest hit country so it's been very stressful but I'm very lucky to be here. Um, as Peter and Claire said, it's it almost, you know, it's wonderful to see the numbers um, kind of trickle down when elsewhere they're still dramatically climbing back up. So I'm grateful for that. Um, yeah, I think it's been also really busy work-wise because obviously we're a global um, a human rights group. I lead our surveillance uh, program. Um, so we've been really busy with publications. Uh, providing insight um, to governments who have asked for it, um, you know, commenting on the different sort of uh, proposals that have been put forward. And we have um, also certain ongoing litigation things that uh, don't stop. Um, so yeah, it's been a wild ride. I think for the app, um, I haven't installed it and I won't, um, but that's because I work from home and I always have, and I have very limited need uh, to engage with the outside world. And something that we teach as a digital rights NGO is 
everyone's threat model should look a little different, whether that's, and I think that applies to all sorts of aspects of our lives. Um, you know, everyone's approach to this should be different based on the way that you need to interact with the world and the sort of people who are in your space, um, you know, who you interact with and, and the way you want to get back to things. So if, if I wanted to, um, you know, or if I needed to get back into an office and um, sort of flow, flow in with people more, um, or I was really concerned about, you know, uh, my uh, elderly or, or young ones, which I don't have, um, I would I would probably um, install it. I think the Australian government hasn't taken, in terms of privacy, the worst route available. So I'm actually pretty, I'm okay with the way this app is being done. Uh, but personally for me, it just doesn't make much sense. I mostly just sit at home and I go out for groceries once a week. So that's um, interesting. I would have, I, yeah. I, I called you up to the head of the queue because I thought you would be in furious disagreement with Claire. But um, I, I have noticed working with the digital rights groups on this, there is a sense that the government has listened to privacy concerns rather than just rolled something over the top. Do you think that's a fair, a fair characterization of where we're at at the moment? Um, I think so. I'm a bit concerned about the um, kind of reports that have come up about Clearview AI and using facial recognition to more proactively uh, track the spread in the population. I'm incredibly apprehensive of that. Uh, but in terms of the sort of proposals that we saw for these apps, uh, some of which use like GPS and Wi-Fi and other uh, you know solutions, I think the Bluetooth beacons and the proximity tracking rather than location tracking um, has been a preferred way to do that. Um, there are certain ways in which it's been rolled out in Australia, which I take issue with. Um, and I, I don't know how technical <laughs> people want me Not to be. <laughs> A little bit, okay. Um, so the way, for instance, the IDs are distributed, um, you know, the app logs into a server every two hours, and it, that's been done differently in different countries where, um, you know, you have an ID exchange more frequently. It's also not centralized on a server. It's done on your device, which is a lot better. Um, I imagine Sasha will have, he's nodding, so I imagine he'll have something to add on that. So there are technical things that I think should be improved, but overall, looking, you know, if you're looking to do technological contact tracing, and Peter, you know, I have a lot of opinions about why that is a mistake in its own, and I hope to get into that later. But if you're going to do that, I think the, the way um, to do it is through the Bluetooth beacon and proximity, um, rather than GPS or location. So great. Um, we'll just round out the intros. Um, Sasha, um, you're meant to be on the glorious author's book tour of small bookshops around the nation at the moment. So how are I you can't... going? Yeah. I am on that tour. I go from the living room to the bedroom. So, you know, I, I have my Zoom sessions in different rooms. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Um, and how have you been going? Good. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for having me along, Peter. And, and Lucy and Claire, I, I, um, you know, you had a lot of interesting things to say, a, a lot of which I agree with. How am I going? Look, I feel really lucky. Claire said she feels lucky. I feel lucky that, that we're in Australia, which um, is in this instance so lucky in, in many ways. Uh, and I think our governments have been doing a good job to, gen you know, it's not with some exceptions, but I think they've been doing a good job. They ended up moving quite quickly. Uh, this health crisis has been dealt with really well. Um, I feel lucky on a personal level as well. You know, I've got a comfortable house. Um, my job is secure for the moment, you know, not forever. I work at a university, so at UTS in Sydney. Uh, universities are really hard hit. Um, but for the moment, all is, all is, is well there. Um, so, you know, we've still got an income, my wife and I, our kids are at a good age. It's actually, in terms of our family, there's been some really wonderful moments and some real positives to come out of this, you know, sort of bonding moments and really rich moments of being engaged with their education and just with each other's lives. So, you know, I feel really lucky in a whole lot of ways. Um, but of course, there have been some challenges. Naturally, um, the book launch is a whole different exercise. And yet, you know, that too, privacy is such a, a relevant issue at the moment. So the, the book comes out at this weird time. It's something that I've been thinking about and researching for seven years. And the date of May 1 as the official launch date was set months and months ago before COVID-19. And then coronavirus comes along and we all get locked down. And the publisher thought, do we still go ahead with this date as planned? And New South Books is the publisher. And they thought we should. And, and I'm glad they did. 
Uh, and I think now is a really good time to think about privacy. So the book is written without mentioning coronavirus, but I don't think it needs to. It's certainly one of the key arguments is we need to think about privacy. It's really important, here's why, but we need to balance it against all sorts of other rights and interests. So public health is an obvious one, you know, the eradication of diseases or preventing serious crimes or, you know, all these sort of data can be used in all these really powerful ways. And we, we need to think about that and we need to explore that. But we also need to keep in mind that privacy is really important. It's been undervalued. It's woefully underprotected in Australia. You know, the legal protections for privacy mm. are terrible. So we really need to, to fix those. Sorry, Peter. So, so what has been, as someone that's thought deeply about privacy, what's been your thought process on whether or not to download this piece of technology? Yeah, so of course I'm initially cautious and I asked a lot of questions and wanted to do a lot of reading about it, but I agree with Lucy that um, this is certainly not the worst option. Um, the government has taken privacy very seriously. Um, I do have some concerns, you know, why do we need a central database? Do we really need one? There are other proposals that don't have one. Um, Amazon's involvement, I'm not entirely comfortable with. Um, you know, so there, there are questions there, but I think uh, given um, the various range of options um, and given the public health crisis that we're facing, this is a pretty good compromise and I commend the government for being so transparent, you know, and hopefully they'll, they'll reveal more about the source code and so on, but they've been pretty transparent and to me the really big thing to come out of this is that this is how, this should be the normal, right, this should be the norm, this is how the government should talk to us about privacy issues, this is how the government, the federal government, other governments should talk to us about laws that they're passing. They need to take privacy this seriously all the time and they haven't. So in the past, things like the metadata retention bill, it just doesn't have privacy protections. You know, there's no external oversight of uh, the people who can authorize uh, access to people's metadata. So this to me, hopefully will enable us all to think, okay, actually privacy matters, the COVID trace app gets it kind of right. Now, what else can we do? One thing is to look at laws that have already been passed that, that are in this space, but then also what reform do we need? Because we need a lot. We need a lot of big reforms. Claire, before I go to a few questions from the room and there's the, the chat's going off like wildfire, I must say. Um, what's your expectations of the parliamentary oversight that will be attached to this? And what are you looking for when parliament returns in terms of legislation. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, firstly, I, I just want to say, I, I think what Sasha said there is really important. The whole interplay of COVID with technology, and we're all using technology in ways that we could never have fathomed two months ago. Um, it, it is a huge opportunity for us as a policy community and as a society to step back and ask whether we are having these debates in a constructive way. And up until we had a conversation about the app as a nation, like the way that we are talking about technology in policy, in the public, it is not good enough. Like that, it is not a high quality conversation. And we do have an opportunity to use this as an inflection point and say, why can't we have better conversations like this one? And it's very telling why, because the government needs us to trust them in the app and that's like we don't have a lot of uh, conversations where we actually get to decide whether we um, have technological interferences in our lives or otherwise but in this occasion we do have a choice to make and so the government has valued our privacy and they have put in place protections now there's things that Lucy you mentioned that might have been done differently I think they should have given us a source code there are ways that this could have been improved but at least they took it seriously and at least they changed a bunch of um, ways that these um, the law works to make sure that these are protected. So um, two things to say on the legislative front. I think the first thing is we've got to get a piece of law that accurately reflects. So what's happened is um, Greg Hunt has made a determination under his powers in the Biosecurity Act to make a regulation which sets out the terms in which this data is used basically it is a regulation that Greg Hunt could change at any time. And the pressure's been put on the government to produce a law that would require the parliament to then assess whether it can be changed or not. So we need to see a draft of a law that accurately reflects the regulation that he has created. And I think it's a pretty good regulation that very much limits the way that this data that's being collected can be used. 
And I think there's been um, a lot of really constructive calls about the Privacy Commissioner having a specific role here. So we do want to have oversight to make sure that the law is properly being followed. And that's something else that Labor would like to see legislated when we return in May. If I can just make one more quick point, I think this whole incident just shows us exactly what Sasha said, which is that the privacy protections we have in Australia at the moment have not kept pace with the times. That's why Greg Hunt had to invent a completely new law to do what he, um, what he needs us to do, which is trust him with our data. The um, digital platforms inquiry that the ACCC released last year called for a whole scale review of the Privacy Act. And I'm very much in favour of that because we do need to have a conversation. If we're going to have a new, exciting digital economy in Australia, how are we going to get Australians to full time engage with that? We're going to need to show them that we're protecting their data better than we have in the past. I totally, thanks Claire. Um, we're going to go to a few questions in a sec. I totally forgot to announce the poll results. I was assuming everyone could see them, but can you see them now? Interesting, huh? So 26% already have, 9% um, intend to. Um, some of those intends might also not be able to work the technology, which some of us will be in that camp. 41% still deciding and 25% saying they won't. So that's a bit of a, a, a mixed response. Um, I'm going to call, I think it's Terry um, up to the stage. He had a specific question for you, Claire. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yep. Uh, Claire, um, I'm just wondering why, uh, before you got to the stage of looking at a proposed bill with legislative controls rather than just regulatory controls or promises by ministers, why you and others have signed up prior to all of that when, in fact, a lot of us are not all that happy with, for example, the transparency that surrounded Amazon winning the contract, uh, other principles like redress for people who have been, who might be victimised uh, in some way by misuse or abuse of this system, uh, a continuing oversight by, let's say, the Privacy Commissioner, a genuinely informed consent by people. All of those issues uh, have to be built into legislation, as you are implying and saying. But why are we signing up before that? I'm, I'm prepared to look at it. Um, but I'm not happy until I get that legislative control in place and then I can start to relax a bit. And I, and I think I represent that 26% or so who say basically no at this stage, but we, we can be converted with legislative protection. Yeah. Um, thanks, Terry. And um, you're obviously very informed about the conversation and I'm very respectful of your, your point of view. I guess the thing I would say is that there's real urgency here. Um, we actually can't just um, wait for a long time for, um, like, I mean, if we all wait till the parliament goes back in the week of the 11th of May, we've just lost, uh, you know, three weeks where three weeks really matters in this um, situation that we're in. Like we are, like the economy is ground to a halt out there and we actually do need to get things back up and running. And there are health concerns as well that are on my mind. Um, so I guess the, the things to say are we've got a regulation that's been created by Greg Hunt already and that regulation has very tight controls around how your data can be used and we're going to get into a legislative process where that regulation is made into law. So for the time being, I'm happy with the restrictions as they are. But, um, you know, there's a lot of people on this call who I don't think will ever be happy with the restrictions that we put down. And it is going to be up to a little bit personal preferences of what level of ambiguity around these things you can withstand. And I guess our levels of ambiguity are different. Um, Sam De Silva from Digital Rights Watch has put a really good comment in the chat, which is it actually comes down to our digital literacy. And there's a bit of a sense at the moment that we're, all of us having to really fast track our, our understanding and maybe confront questions we've never been asked before, you know? Um, and I think one of the things that, you know, I'm interested in hearing from all the panelists on is that sense that over the last 20 years, technology has just happened to us and we haven't had much personal agency. Um, I know you've been thinking about that in the context of your book, Sasha. Um, it feels that we've become the subjects of technology rather than the, the owners of it. And um, I'm, mm. I'm interested in your reflections there. Yeah, look, I, I, I love 
you using the word agency and, and having agency with regard to technology. So, so my project, you know, very briefly, my research was all about taking one ethical principle, which is from Immanuel Kant, uh, who is beloved by some, not so much by others. Um, you know, we can, that's a rabbit hole that would take the rest of the hour, so I won't go there, but his Wait. principle, <laughs> his principle that, that I apply is the formula of humanity. And the key phrase is never treat anyone, including yourself, merely as a means. Uh, and so there's, there's a number of ways to interpret that, but it comes, one of the key ways is that informed consent is really crucial. Um, and the reason that Kant came to this is because he valued our autonomy, our dignity, our reason, every, every person's. And this was irreducibly valuable. So a person is different to a thing, a tool, a wall, whatever it is. And this, this to me became a really good way of thinking about privacy so that we, we, we don't use each other as things or companies don't use us as things just to get what they want, but we, we respect each other's agency, autonomy, dignity, and so on. And I think this is a key, it's a key point. This is what we need to do when it comes to privacy, but also technology generally. This is, we need to think about what we're developing, why we're developing, what the ethics are involved. And we as humans all need to be involved in this process mm -hmm. of thinking about, okay, where do we want to go with this? We make the technology, you know, collectively, we make this technology. What are we going to develop? How are we going to use it? What sort of laws are we going to need to put in place to, to make sure that's as ethical, as fair as possible? Um, so I'm assuming that Mark Zuckerberg's never read Kant? <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a really good question. I, I would love to ask him if he's read Kant. <laughs> um, but, you know, so he, he has argued in the past about the right to connectivity. Um, and you can, I can see that, you know, that, that, that's important, but I think he had a big wake up moment about two years ago when he realized, okay, it's not okay just to put everything online in Facebook, which seemed to be the initial model. Um, mm -hmm. so he realizes now that there are competing rights and interests, and this is a tricky thing with, with ethics and all these, these difficult rights and interests that we need to balance. Lucy, one of the, um, one of the, the, the things that emerged from the last, you know, global, I wouldn't say financial crisis, but the security crisis after 9-11 was really the technology that's led to what Zuboff now calls surveillance capitalism. I wonder if you've been reflecting on um, where the risk matrix is for this sort of technology to end up having commercial applications and broader applications from the state. Yeah, thanks. Um like vigorously doodling notes as well because like <laughs> so much stuff coming up in the chat and I you know there's already um obviously this community is super aware of some of the uh, more hidden um triggers in these conversations yeah surveillance capitalism is a real issue I think after 9-11 we saw exactly what the sort of crisis framing can get us in terms of legislation in the U.S. that's created like really long-lasting ripple effects um for Fourth Amendment and you know what people even constitute as a very fundamental like right to their own termination and privacy. Um, and the issue with these things is that one crisis tends to spiral into another. So one of the things we've called for both at, at Access Now, but as well at Digital Rights Watch, where I'm a board member and other groups, is the government needs to be very clear about what the end of this particular crisis looks like. Um, and when, you know, anything that has been agreed upon will come to an end. And that's something, you know, if you're on the fence or still deciding about the app or anything like that, I would say wait for the legislation and see what's in there because, and I think this was a great point to be brought up by Terry, it's really like <laughs> very speculative and you're trusting a government that I think hasn't earned that trust on privacy. I mean, it's just, you know, my colleagues from sort of the global groups, um, ping me with a chuckle of what's happening in Australia this week. Um, and I think there's a real tragedy and an imbalance of powers, which I think is reflected here as well. The government, on the one hand, is really eager to piggyback on surveillance capitalism. And I think that's the real, my real criticism here is, you know, phones are something that people own, you know, on a more meta level, you're asking, you know, you're rolling out something on the presumption that people have access to this technology, um, that they are cooperating with these companies. And in the meantime, you haven't set up a regulatory or legislative framework for people to enforce their rights in that setting. And then you're using that setting to um, peddle government, you know, assistance in times of crisis. And I think that's, 
that's fundamentally flawed. Um, and then the other thing I worry about in Australia is there just isn't a division. Um, I think uh, there isn't a division of agencies. So in Europe, we have, you know, a lot of different sort of elements of the government have to come together and here. There's just a lot of mandates underneath home affairs. And I just worry that sitting, you know, the people sitting in one building kind of conflates and creates interests that just can't be balanced mm. when you come to a situation like this, which is why mm. there's so much apprehension in the Australian public. So many people are commenting here. What about amendments to legislation? How can we trust them? Obviously, because you don't have, uh, you know, a, a human rights entity that stands on its own feet. You don't have a security and network entity that stands on its own feet. It's all underneath, uh, you know, the same place. And I think that's that's the real crisis for, um, you know, privacy and data protection um, in Australia. And the fact that surveillance capitalism just thrives alongside it because government is super eager to like hitch their wagon onto it, uh, you know, that's that's a separate issue. And one that we've seen with TOLAF, with the encryption legislation as well, you know, the gov governments don't uh, do their own mass surveillance programs anymore. They just figure out a way to tap into um, tech companies and, you know, huzzah, they've, they've set it up for them. And that's, I think that's the real failure of government in this space. Mm. Yeah. Can I just jump in, Peter? Um, mm. uh, I, I mean, really interesting li listening to Sasha and Lucy's contribution there. Um, and I'm very, much in agreement about some of what you said. I mean, the, the way that so many um, tech issues have been handled in recent years by the parliament and by the government, you know, it's been terrible for the overall trust that people feel in technology. And a lot of the people on this phone call will be thinking, well, you know, the government said one thing and did the complete opposite when it came to the encryption legislation that, you know, probably no single event in Australia's technology history has trashed the trust that government had, uh, that uh, people had in, in government's engagement in tech than that. But I, I think it's really important in these conversations that we don't just focus on the risk here because there's a lot of opportunity for Australia in all this. And Lisa, Lucy, you talked about surveillance capitalism. Absolutely. Like, I'm very concerned about the fact that my image is being captured wherever I go in the city and no one ever asked me for that and I don't really know what happens to the data and how I'm protected and I know that I don't own the data. But I mean, think about the way that we see data being used around the world for public good, you know, um, seeing where people go after a natural disaster so we know where to drop aid packages, um, making sure that we can plan our cities better because we know how people are using them, thinking about, you know, how we can optimise setting up health clinics so people are getting vaccinations for their children. Like there are huge opportunities for us to function better as a society and produce amazing outcomes, you know, longer years of life for people, better well-being, um, better standard of living. Um, so I just think the, the focus needs to be um, there are privacy issues that no society's ever dealt with before, but how do we grapple them um, and how are we going to have a good quality conversation about the big things that need to change for us to be able to get those opportunities but not end up in a society where we're being constantly surveilled without any control over the data we generate. Mm. Um, Sasha, that kind of feeds into one of the ideas in your book, which is around networks of privacy, if I've characterised it correctly, but yeah. it's not just being public or private, you've got this sort of middle concept. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Look, this is really a confounding issue. Privacy is just really um, mind-bending, right? It's complicated. Um, and the more you look into it, the more complicated it seems to, to get. So one thing is that point you mentioned at the end there that you... You know, let's not think of this as a binary with public and private as at the two ends of that binary. Um, you know, and, and this is to me most obvious in the way that we're often in multiple places at once, um, thanks to our smartphones or our laptops. So this is a great example. So I'm in my I'm in my bedroom actually at the moment, which I've made to look like a, a makeshift home studio. <laughs> um, but at the same time, and, and you are all in your various rooms in your homes, it looks like. Um, and yet at the same time, we're in this kind of weird public space of Zoom, sort of pseudo public or semi public. And there are different privacy norms and different privacy rules and public rules that go on. And so we get this kind of layering of norms and expectations and that makes things really complicated. So that, that's, that's one point and that, that's like, that's really tricky just to think about, let alone for the law to grapple with. And beyond that, you mentioned that idea of collective networked relational privacy. I think that's another thing that we need to get out of this so that my data, yeah, me, who I am, um, my data can be 
accessed and can be collated and put into a profile even when I'm not on the network, you know, just because people around me will be on the network or because inferences can be drawn about the sort of person I am because I'm like that person over there in the next suburb and that person over there. So there's, we have reached this really critical point where there is so much data and the network, the larger network reveals all of us in a country like Australia. So we need to really think deeply about what that means, what the consequences of that are and how we can, how we can change that balance. You know, I see sort of some comments about let's get a bill of rights, you know, let's get a human, mm. a federal human rights act. So those, we don't have those in Australia. Mm. And, and that's really- I, I'm a, On that note, I might call up, there was somebody, I don't know who it is from the Human Rights Law Centre in the call. Do you want to just sort of give us the, the short version of what a bill of rights for digital would look like? Certainly can. I'm also hoping, sorry, it's Alice here from Human Rights Law Centre. Um, also hoping that my colleague Danny, who works directly on the Charter of Rights campaign, is around. Uh, wait just for a second. You can no? do a tap okay. dance while we're waiting or something. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, so we've been calling for a Charter of Rights for a couple of years now, and I certainly encourage everybody to uh, jump on our HRC website to check out the Charter of Rights campaign. But essentially the Charter of Rights would be a huge step forward in giving us an avenue to protect our right to privacy, but also our democratic rights, which are undermined by um, this kind of surveillance technology, as well as our economic rights and our right to review, which can be undermined by this kind of technology too. So I think we're just talking in the um, privacy frame at the moment, but um, all of the tech that has just been mentioned, all of the really great things that tech can achieve in our world, um, if designed poorly, can actually have huge implications on the most vulnerable communities that we have. So mm. what a Charter of Rights would do is ensure that administrative, like the, the bureaucrats and, um, you know, the, the Commonwealth governments when, for instance, yeah. you know, paying people Centrelink, et cetera, um, have to do so in a way that is compliant with people's right to health, you know, people's um, right to privacy, and it will have real impact on the design of this kind of technology. Thanks for that. And it's, it's part of a, I think, broader discussion that is underway and where I want to take today's discussion, which is the way that technology comes into our world. I think the model, as we've said, is very different. I've... Um, very clumsily in the past used the analogy that a lot of technological disruption appears to me a bit like the way that um, Europeans treated Australia in the early days, terra nullius, that um, we're, we're, we're not, you know, your laws don't exist, we're not a taxi service, we're a car sharing service that you pay to take us from A to B so your laws don't apply or we're not a media company, we're just a platform that distributes news and information, so your media laws don't apply, and it goes, and so it goes. So I'm, I'm interested in this idea of the model of disruption that has sort of been almost heroic in Western capitalism for the last, you know, 100 years, versus this idea of thinking things through and having frameworks before you run rampant with it. And I'll, I'll start with Claire because I think, you know, particularly the tech sector in Australia are champions of this notion of disruption. And so is there a prospect to put some rings around it and have real rigorous thought around the implications of change before it happens? Yeah. I mean, it's a great question, Peter. And I mean, there's no one sentence answer to this. It's something that every legislature in the world is trying to grapple with. We've got to find a way for us to encourage the huge dynamism that we need in our economy to keep Australians living standards where they are today and make no mistake, like the reason that we are coping so well with coronavirus is because we've got one of the best healthcare systems in the world. And these things are only possible when we have a thriving economy. Um, but we want people to follow the law and we certainly can't use technology as some kind of excuse for rights that people have fought for for generations to be deteriorated overnight. And I think you see that, you know, in an industrial relations context frequently, you know, the idea that innovation is underpaying people to take food from restaurants to their homes is just, you know, a complete load of shit, basically, if you don't mind me saying. Um, but there's a few things that I think uh, we need to think about here. Um, the first is that 
I don't think we should always see regulation as something putting a lid on innovation. Actually, regulation can be, if it's done properly, regulation can be a huge driver of innovation. And the trick for parliaments is to think about what kind of regulation can we um, get ahead of, basically. And data is a really good example because, in, especially in, in wealthy countries around the world, pe people are increasingly understanding that data is being collected about them without their permission and being sold to someone else um, without their permission. Um, and so I think this is a real direction and we've seen it in the EU where they've got the GDPR and in California and lots of other places in the world where they're having a good discussion about this. So I don't mm. think it's a good argument on the data privacy issue, not for us to try to get ahead of things a little bit. Um, but there's also just a natural evolution of our law in Australia that hasn't happened. The Privacy Act was, I think it was passed in 1989. I mean, the internet basically wasn't in common usage, you know, for another decade beyond that. Um, so we do need to have a real think about how we can evolve laws that we had before. The thing not to get lost by um, in this conversation, though, is the opportunity here. This is important. We, we don't want technology to disappear. It is enriching our lives in so many ways. And the balancing act for parliaments is to try to make sure that we get the benefits and just mm. reduce the costs. And we don't do that by legislating everything that's innovative out of existence. Yeah. The Human Rights Commissioner, Ed Santo, who's been a guest in um, Australia at Home and has got an amazing report on AI um, and, and sort of digital disruption out for comment at the moment, makes the point that if we could embed um, human rights by design into AI, Australia would have a different product mm, that would Yeah, it's a really good example. Could really good example. Export to the world. Yeah. Yeah. So um, just just for people who are not familiar with this concept, what, what we're really saying here is if we, we would we can create our own domestic market for innovation in ethical AI that can then be produced around the world. Like Australia's not going to be the cheapest or the first out of the box with a lot of this stuff, but we might be able to develop real niche world beating industries here if we regulate smartly. Yeah, I know. Um, I'll go to you next, Lucy. I know that the, the facial recognition is also part of Ed's report and calling for a moratorium on that. And obviously some tension around a world where in the short term tracking is essential, but also putting up some sort of walls around the way that particular technology develops. Where are you? I, I know that Digital Rights Watch is preparing a campaign around this. So what's your thinking on what the response should be there? Yeah, I mean, this is a super complex question. <laughs> I'm going to be try try and be mindful of the time. Um, one of the pillars of why I love doing this sort of work is because personally, I don't want to see democracy die at the shrine of innovation and kind of techno solutionism. And I think that's kind of what very often uh, happens in, especially in situations in times of crisis. Um, in Europe, we also saw this uh, after, for instance, the Paris, um, sort of the tragic events in Paris with the shootings, um, you know, where the French government just kept extending and extending and extending uh, the state of emergency, which gave them unprecedented powers. Um, and I think as, you know, individuals and as citizens, a lot of people are just so overwhelmed already by their daily life. They're not as active, I think, in questioning some of the basic decisions and the sort of evidence for them. Um, for instance, you know, I could say at the beginning, like I said, this app isn't from a privacy perspective, you know, there are tweaks that could be made, but it's not the worst. But we've already conceded to contact tracing and digital contact tracing being a necessary thing uh, to come at this stage. And frankly, from some of the conversations that we've had in Europe with epidemiologists and as well as in US and Latin with some of the governments, uh, you know, contact tracing already happens manually. Um, so the question then becomes is the how much money is the government spending on which solution? And does that really answer the needs of the community at the time? And in places like Singapore, uh, we've seen a huge spike in cases despite the contact tracing application being pretty widely used. So I think the efficacy as well as actually this route needs to be questioned much more critically. And that's something that I haven't seen happen. And I think that's why people were so terrified of parliament kind of stepping back at this time, because that's the sort of um, discussion with experts that I think needed to happen there that hasn't. Um, and my other thing that I just want to pull in here, and Peter knows I'm pretty adamant about this, is the sort of accessibility um, that's built into these apps and the sort of um, the amount of people that this techno solutionism leaves out of the loop is huge. 
not everyone has a smartphone. A lot of people in the space that I uh, work in, activists for different reasons, don't have a smartphone. Um, you know, there are uh, people who don't have access, uh, stable access to the internet and connectivity, which is a huge issue in this instance. So you're really solving the issue for a very mainstream snapshot of what Australia looks like. Um, and essentially that really leaves out a lot of the most vulnerable groups, which is perhaps the elderly, uh, maybe some of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, you know, where this information isn't penetrating and isn't as easily picked up as it is by, you know, people like me who are just middle upper class, you know, white folk. Um, so I'm really concerned that the government is focusing on the solution for like those 40 people. And when, you know, they say, oh, we need at least 40 people to adopt this. I'm thinking, yeah, because really it leaves about the 60 other percent of the people um, out of the loop by default. And I think that's a real, um, that's a real tragedy. Accessibility is also something I haven't um, heard being talked about for a lot of people who have um, different challenges integrating, you know, these apps into their daily life. Um, yeah. Uh, so Le Leanne O'Donnell's um, put a link to a, a paper from the Bookings Institute in there too, if people want to see. And I, I was going to call Leanne up to ask her question, but you've kind of answered it. Peter Johnson had an interesting question about parliamentary oversight briefly, if you're there, Peter. Yeah. Yes, I'm here. Can you get me? Yeah. Uh, it seems to me there should be some standard questions that Parliament raises in any cases where there's going to be intrusion on people's rights or privacy. Um, and it applies particularly, of course, to anti-terrorism legislation. But whilst we can see this legislation as necessary, particularly perhaps in the present case, the first question is, are there less intrusive alternatives and have they been examined properly? Um, there should always be sunset um, clauses put in any such legislation so it's properly reviewed in time. And there should be oversight of the application of it, I'd suggest, by a judicial monitor. There are no doubt other tests but isn't this an opportunity to introduce those tests for future legislation of this type? And before we answer that, Laurie Patton had sort of questions along similar lines that you kind of emailed me earlier in the day, Laurie, if you want to sort of throw it into that mix now. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, and look, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say this is uh, actually a Dutch scheme because I don't think 40% is enough. I don't think we're going to get to 40%. And the reason for that is there are as many people out there saying that they are worried about this as there are saying it's fine. So the Data Retention Act was mentioned earlier. That was the most flawed piece of legislation I've ever seen. And the reason that came about was because it was written by lawyers in the Attorney General's department who just don't know the inks. So my question for Claire particularly is, will Labor commit to a much broader range of consultations before it brings in legislation. Most of the things that people are talking about now that need to be done to tweak the thing, put it on fixed before they launched it, if they just spoken to the right people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Should I just take that one away, Peter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, thanks so much for your questions there. So Peter, how are you? Lovely to hear your voice. Um, I think you've given us a great starting point for some questions there. Um, and I think, honestly, the three points that you set out there um, are things that we will be looking for. And those are things that, um, with the exception of oversight, are in the regulation. And certainly, I'm happy to say that Labor will be making sure um, to the extent that we can, given that we're not the government, but we'll be pushing to get those things included in the bill. Um, in terms of um, the question about, I just want to push back on one little point about whether this is kind of truly necessary and did we look at other options and were the right people consulted. I mean, I've got plenty of criticisms about things the government has done, but failing to consult with experts in how it's responded to coronavirus isn't one of them. And I think this is one of the very rare um, examples I've seen where actually the government's really listened and so many um, epidemiologists and doctors and researchers have been involved and they have said that we need a contract contact mm -hmm. tracing app so it's not like some you know some um, faceless regulator came up with this it's actually something that was recommended by a whole bunch of people whose expertise lies only in um, public health um, in terms of your question about um, the encryption legislation look I absolutely agree I think that was a um, you know you, you see the cost of these things now when the parliament does not manage these discussions well and where 
Um, we talk about security and technology and privacy issues in this kind of um, falsely urgent context. And everyone's trying to come to grips with difficult technological um, sort of concepts in an environment where you know, you've got a few days to get your head around these things. And that's not necessary most of the time. And I don't think it was necessary in the case of the encryption bill. And I just think it was a, you know, the whole thing just really disappointed me um, how um, the government decided to pursue that. So I think I'm, I'm happy to say that I don't think that Labor would approach those issues in the same way. Um, I don't see my colleagues trying to use the parliament as a wedge more than a tool of actually trying to, um, you know, improve the, the lives of Australians. Um, so yeah, I think it, the, the incident left a great deal to be desired. And if I can say anything about, you know, linking it back to this current discussion about the COVID app, the cost of, um, the cost of stuffing up these conversations comes to the fore here, because when the government really needs our trust on something, they find that there's a whole community of people out there like you who've watched the parliament um, not have a constructive debate about something that was very, very important. And so we just start the conversation from a point of suspicion and that was unnecessary. You said, will we get to 40%? I don't wanna make any predictions because I do want this app to be successful. But I think the biggest war we're fighting here is actually not so much suspicion, it's probably apathy. Most of the people that I represent don't raise um, privacy concerns with me about the app. They just probably haven't really heard of it and haven't really thought about it yet. We had a brief opportunity at the beginning of this debate to get people excited about the opportunity that this presents to get the economy back and rolling. And I just see the day slipping away as we kind of fumble around with the communications task. And, and that's frustrating to me. Mm. Hey, um, before we do the, the final wrap up, Lucy, you're also on the board of Digital Rights Watch, which is a great advocacy organisation. For any of you that are in the chat that aren't members or signed up to their list, this would be a great opportunity. And you're releasing some public information about the app um, this week, aren't you? Do you want to just tell people a little bit about that? And David might put a link to that in the chat. Yeah, I was actually wondering if David can jump in. And yeah, if you want to, if you're there, Dave. He's here. Yep, I'm here, g'day. Hello. Um, oh, there he is. Yes, good morning. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, we've, uh, we've tried to keep pace with the, uh, with the trickle of information that, that came out of the government uh, kind of day by day uh, in the lead up to the announcement of the, of the app. And we've, uh, we've got an explainer up on the website around uh, our concerns with uh, the design of the app and how it, uh, how it relates to uh, existing powers and other legislation that, that folks have already, have already talked about. Uh, we're hopefully working together with a bunch of organisations to come up with some uh, input or advice in where we think the, the legislation around the, around the app should go uh, and some of the specifics that it, uh, that it should cover off. But I think broadly everybody's in agreement that uh, regardless of uh, the level of trust in the government or, or not, everybody wants the the app to, to succeed. I think everybody's approaching it with, um, with pretty good intentions in, in that regard. Uh, and uh, as, as Claire said, there was a lot of uh, input from, uh, from experts in, in health fields that, uh, that led to the decision to adopt the app. What there wasn't was, uh, was input from uh, rights organisations uh, and members of the tech community as well, perhaps, because there are some legitimate shortcomings with, uh, with the way the app works that will impact on its, uh, on its adoption and its use by those people that have downloaded it. Thanks, David. Um, we're, we're, we're getting to the hour. Before we go, I want to give Sasha a moment to answer a broader question and again plug his book that is coming out tonight. So after you've joined Digital Rights Watch, you should go on, online and buy net privacy. But my final <laughs> question to you, Sasha, was if um, Kant was in this discussion, what do you yeah. think he'd be making of it? <laughs> yeah, well, that, that very question is, is uh, what I end the book with, really. What would Kant make of all this? Um, and, and it's really quite straightforward. You know, he, that phrase I used before about not using each other merely as a means, a lot of this stuff that we're talking about is using people merely as a means, you know, that phrase of surveillance capitalism, uh, a lot of 
a lot of various apps that we use, a various technology that is used on us. It's not the way we use it so much as the way it's used on us, right? Um, we don't fully get all that much choice in a lot of cases. There's this kind of illusion of user control that is in many cases just a smokescreen by some of the digital platforms because we don't actually have so much control, not nearly as much as we sometimes think or we, we told we have. But um, to, to add to that, and I guess what would Kant say, I think one of my big recommendations is that we do need to improve the law. We need some reforms. And a great place to look, in my opinion, is the GDPR, the European privacy laws that are, um, that have a lot of really good points. They do put consent, they give consent a really important role. Um, the wording of the type of consent they're looking for is really um, explicit. There are all these elements and you need to be able to opt out and, and withdraw your consent as easily as you can opt in in the first place. So there's all those kinds of uh, elements, the right to be forgotten or the right to erasure as it's more formally known, um, which is something that the ACCC recommended last year. And, and that's something that Claire mentioned. So, Last year, the ACCC handed down its report into digital platforms, its digital platform inquiry. It has a list of excellent, I think, privacy reform recommendations. So those two are really good, good points to start, the GDPR in Europe and the ACCC's recommendations from last year. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I wanna say is that many people in the chat and also just in conversation have mentioned trust. And, and that's really key. Like there's a real interconnection between privacy and trust. Um, but the larger issue of trust is something we're struggling with as a society. And I've, spe I've specifically researched trust in news media. There's a real problem there uh, and there's trust in government issues as well. We have to think about that. This is a real opportunity for us as a society and for government um, to, to raise these levels of trust by acting in a trustworthy way, by bringing each other into the conversation um, and, and treating each other with the respect that we should treat each other. Um, so that might be that might be Kant's bottom line. Let's treat each other with respect. Um, that was his big thing. Um, and, you know, think about how we can treat each other, but also enact laws that uh, that make it make us able to respect each other better. At the moment, we're being disrespected quite a lot. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. We've actually picked up in our essential report an uptick in trust in public institutions over the last month. And we're, we're, we're seeing a government that is getting public support behind them um, by doing things that governments don't normally do, work cooperatively and collaboratively across, it, across the nation. So before I round out, any final reflections, Claire, any messages that you'll take from this back to, to Parliament in a couple of weeks? Um, no, I mean, I think, I, I mean, I think it's just been a really good discussion and thank you to Sasha and Lucy for your, um, you know, engagement and, you know, I'm really respectful of the points that you've raised there. And um, I think one thing we can all agree on is that we do need to have a better discussion about how technology is integrating with their, with our lives. There's lots of upside here, but also, you know, we can create a world that none of us would want to live in just by stepping back and not being thoughtful and active in this conversation. So thanks guys for engaging. Yeah. Okay, last thing before we go, um, Hannah's set up an exit poll. So the same questions we asked before, <laughs> really quickly, see if anyone's changed their mind. Um, I'm still deciding. I guess the, I guess the already haves are gonna remain stable. It's just whether anything else shifts. There's been a hey. bit of a shift from what I can see from the no, I won't to the still deciding column. I think if, any, if there's any output, that's probably it at the moment. Hey, um, did you want to say one last thing, Claire? Sorry. Oh, yeah, I just, um, Sasha's plugging his book. I'm also plugging my new podcast. I've started a podcast talking about um, the big picture issues that COVID is giving rise to and how we can uh, think about how they'll affect Australia in the years to come. So it's called The Long View and it's available on iTunes. I'd love you guys to have a listen and let me know what you think. Excellent. So we've all got, we've got digital rights, we've got Sasha's <laughs> book and we've got Claire's podcast and we've got Australia at Home Every Day. Tomorrow is um, a double act. Um, Daniel Stone's going to be talking to a bunch of photographers at lunchtime, talking photos. And then tomorrow night, we're hosting the May Day Toast for Unions New South Wales. And we're going to have inspirational speeches from Tom Keneally, Sally McManus and Sharon Burrow from, from Brussels. And then we're all going to sing Solidarity Forever, led by Billy Bragg, who is going to be dialing in from London in the morning. Well, that should be pretty exciting. And then next week, we've got a pretty weird and wild old week, including Malcolm Turnbull for lunch next Thursday. So stay. now you're on the list. You'll keep getting the invites. Please help grow this community. And thanks, everyone, for your participation today. Um, until then, 
stay at home, stay connected, and everyone stay safe, yeah? Thank you. Everyone. Thanks for having us, Peter. Thanks, Peter. Bye. Have a good day, everyone. See ya.